welcome and thanks for everyone's participation um, in this so far and um, in participating today. So just to give you an overview, uh, last fall, the College of Science and Math kicked off a retention forum, a series of conversations uh, to, to look at what we can do in the classroom uh, and within the college specifically. Uh, to help retain our students better. So uh, before we go into too much more detail, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ingish for a welcome. Okay, it's really exciting to see how many people are coming to this. So welcome to the first COSM Retention Forum. I'm really happy to see this idea come to fruition. We started thinking about this a long, long time ago, but the structure only came together and we started having um, participation this fall. But it goes back to more probably to my first time being interim dean and even beyond that to, to being associate dean and working with people in my office with Nick, now Lynn Hartzler, Donna Braswell, Becky's our, our um, accountant, Stephanie Collins now, and then the advising office, Courtney Smith and Sarah Sakura, Matt Skira, and Laura Marker. We've all been talking about what can we do to do of retention and then ultimately the COSM chairs have also been part Hello. of this conversation. So this um, that, hi, I, that was an accidental call but actually if this is Jeff um, this is Deborah Johnson me. and um I okay except me can everybody hear me yes okay this forum goes one step further we invited faculty staff and students to be part of working together on this problem What's been remarkable that is that this work has continued despite the exploding cases in COVID, despite the tragedy and the horror of George Floyd's death and all the um, resulting unrest uh, and the longstanding racial inequity that, that was sort of recognized. And despite the unprecedented activities that have surrounded the election. So that's just been astounding to watch that, that the committees just kept working and continuing on everything that they are doing. In light of everything that happens, I just want to make another point that the critical mission of higher education has become, if ever, more critical, that, that this is the place that students learn to think critically, learn to research and evaluate evidence, learn to understand mathematical relationships and probabilities, and then to make logical conclusions from them. And so our special mission at Wright State, in my opinion, is to make this essential means of being able to interact with the world available to everyone. So after the initial charges that these working groups got, the work that you're here about today, it's been driven by those working groups themselves. They followed lines of inquiry, they made their discoveries, and they're going to make their proposals. So I'm very excited to see what they have to present. Great, thank you, Dr. Ingish, and hopefully I'm sharing my screen now so that you can see that. And um, you just want to take a moment to thank a few people. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody who was involved. Um, as Kathy said, faculty, staff, and students um, uh, participated. So I want to thank Mike Bottomley from the Statistical Consulting Center. Uh, he provided a lot of statistical support for a couple of the working groups, and also Shamina from the library uh, in helping us early on with finding some literature for each of the topics as well. And we also want to thank our team leaders, uh, Dr. Sylvia Newell, uh, Dr. Rachel Ega, um, Dr. Audrey McGowan, and Dr. Jason Dibel uh, each took the lead on one of the groups. So we appreciate their assistance and leadership there as well. So again, the goals, um, we wanted to examine some best practices related to the academic environment specifically within STEM and within science and math, um, and then develop action plans to increase the first year retention in COSM majors. So uh, to specifically to look at the first year majors, here's some of our data from the program review uh, that we did about a year ago. So as you can see, um, I have this broken down by white and historically underrepresented minorities. Uh, so Asian students are not involved or are included in this and those who list unknown as their um, ethnicity are not included in this. But you can see obviously with uh, white students are direct from high school. They tend to stay in the major and they tend to stay at Wright State uh, much better than historically underrepresented minorities. So that's, um, we'll actually get started with our uh, historically underrepresented minority group in a minute. So there's quite a di discrepancy there. Um, and when you look at 
this next one, this is the six year graduation rate for the same group uh, of students. It drops dramatically as well. Actually, it's not the same group. This is data from 2000, um, the graduation data is from 2009 through 2013, and the retention data is from 2014 through 2018. So again, that was provided in our uh, department's program reviews a year ago. So, um, but it does drop dramatically from the first year retention. We lose um, about half of our students in that first year. So that's why we wanted to focus on uh, the first year uh, within our classes. So our four main groups, um, uh, increasing the success of our historically underrepresented minorities was one. Um, looking at our first year seminar courses was another, and that's specifically with our departmental uh, first year seminar courses. Um, and we also wanted to look at our gateway courses uh, and then finally the coaching and mentoring opportunities. So those are our four working groups. Um, and so without further delay, I am going to introduce our first group that will present, um, and that is increasing success of our historically underrepresented minorities. Uh, that was led by Dr. Jason Dibel. Uh, other members of the group were Dr. Megan Root, Laura Marker, um, Dr. Michael Montat, Jimmy Shaw, uh, Dr. Deb Steele Johnson and Dr. Pat Sonner. So, Jason, I will turn it over to you. Hopefully, you're on here. Yes, I am on. And uh, so, you have the slides, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you everybody for coming today. And, uh, you know, first, you know, we we're looking at what was the focus of our group. And one of the things that we decided to do was to go with the National Science Foundation definition of you know what you know uh, falls under the category of underrepresented minorities you know so you know we're looking at students who identify as african american hispanic american indian alaska native and pacific islander we also have added a secondary focus here uh, principally because it is going to be very common among um, all these student populations is uh, effects of you know involvement and sort of impact of a first generation college student also and uh, the uh, principal focus of our group to date has been development of an initial survey for COSM URM students. I think a very common theme we're going to see this afternoon is gathering information. We don't know where we are. We know that the end result is not good, but what is sort of the... Uh, okay, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> um, you know, of uh, gathering data is to find out, you know, in terms of URM students, what they perceive as barriers, what experiences have they had that have either helped, you know, enable success or have, you know, been barriers to success. And then also we wanted to start a process of providing resources to departments that, you know, choose to focus on URM student retention and the overall URM environment. And we'll talk more about that later. So next slide, please. And one thing that started off with this, which was not an official part of the <clears throat> um, our uh, sort of COSM retention, uh, this program in effect, but it was something that was happening in parallel that we decided to partner with and make sure we could get as many people involved, was that the undergraduate research program, the Applying Scientific Knowledge Program, the ASK program, we had funds available to bring in a uh, workshop facilitator, Dr. Buffy Longmire Avatal, and this happened in late October. And uh, specifically targeting um, strategies and issues associated with engaging and sustaining minority student participation in undergraduate research. And uh, it was a very good experience that we had, uh, I think on average, 30 people logged in uh, over the entire half day workshop and numbers at one point, I think approached 38 people actually. And we went over topics such as positionality and diverse learning environments, uh, recruitment, engaging HURMs in research, and then bias and stereotype threat micro aggressions and becoming conscious of such things. And so there was a nice uh, thing that was happening in parallel that uh, was happening within COSM that we wanted to highlight here. So next slide, please. 
And so uh, <clears throat> this group has been really active. It's been a uh, extreme pleasure to work with. And I have to say that our group has decided that we're going to continue moving on. We've already talked about when our next meeting is going to be because uh, we feel like we are within striking distance of making significant accomplishments here. And what we've done is we've uh, developed and we're getting ready to hopefully deploy a survey that's going to gather qualitative and quantitative data. Um, we want to get a good understanding that's both true and accurate of the student challenge challenges and how to best help them and you know to utilize this data that we can gather uh, about equity and opportunity across the student population and with that survey that's going to go out will be invitations to students to participate in follow-up focus groups that we can actually have more of a qualitative conversation get to know um, students and um, move things along. So we've already developed this uh, survey. Um, we are very close to sending it to uh, IRB for approval. Um, the uh, We have uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Steele Johnson has been uh, very gracious to reach out to some graduate students in the psychology department who are very eager to help us with design of the survey. And so we're very close to sending it off to the graduate students and then we'll take another look at it. Then it will go off to IRB. But we are optimistic that this survey will be um, you know, approved and delivered to our students this semester, actually, such that, you know, we can start looking at data over the summer and maybe thinking about things in the fall that we can do to start responding to that. Next slide, please. And what I've done here is that these are some, you know, just a selected, um, questions that will be in the survey. Uh, some of these will be answered on a Likert scale. Some of these we will be providing options for them to, you know, say, okay, th this was something, this was something, and uh, that we were there. So this is, I, I want to uh, qualify that, you know, I'm just giving you a sort of a snapshot of things here. This is not uh, by far the finished product, but just an idea of the kind of questions we're asked. Can you go back uh, one, please? Go back one. Okay. So, have you ever considered changing your major due to the perception of the difficulty of a course or courses? Uh, have you considered changing your major due to feeling unprepared to succeed in future courses? Um, list reasons as to why you dropped or withdrew from a course. This is data that we, you know, would love for all of our students. Thinking back to nearing the end of your high school education, how prepared did you feel to succeed in college? Have you considered changing majors due to interactions with faculty in the program? Do you have a person that you regard as a mentor? Next one, please. Did either or both of your parents attend college? Do you have older siblings who have attended college? Do you have other close family members who have attended? Do you, you know, what kind of degrees? What time commitments do you balance with your academic studies? This is data that we will have a lot of assumptions on, but we need to get, you know, just hardened data that we can work with and tie it to our students. And we're going we're gonna to ask for student permission, excuse me, to get data on their academic performance also and try to make some correlations with the survey data and their academic performance and hence why we have to go through irb for this next slide please and so what we would look at for in the mid-range <coughs> excuse me is um you know what can we do with this? You know, is it study skills workshops or built in that are, are built into first year courses, summer bridge programs? Um, you know, looking more at a self study across the college um, in terms of DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, and then also identifying resources that we can you know use to support faculty who may be wanting to address these issues within their courses or within their departments as well. But we really don't know what we're reacting to yet, and that's why we've got to focus on this survey. And for the long term, um, the, you know, the, the, these are the things that we need to do, you know, and uh, you may look at a lot of these and say, well, th you know, this is not happening anytime soon. We, we need to know and think about what we can do. And so we can work to that point. And so, hence, you know, recruit the recruitment and retainment of more faculty members from HURM groups into the college, but also creating a welcoming environment for DEI, you know, with all stakeholders assuming responsibility and workload. And, uh, you know, how do we, you know, create a better environment for our faculty, staff, and students, you know, in the mind, in the mind of uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion? And one thing is that, uh, you know, um, 
Megan Rua identified was that uh, there are resources out there. There's the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity uh, that we can become a member in. It's pricey, but there's a lot of benefits for that. And uh, how can we better recruit students also? And until we understand, and but we need to end, uh, understand what's going on with our URM students first in order to, you know, uh, we can't just recruit students. We have to make sure that, you know, once these students are here, that we are preparing them for success and putting them on the successful path. And so what we've identified, next slide please, is that there are a wealth of resources out there. And what I would encourage every department to do is to go look into all of your professional societies. And a lot of the professional societies have had task forces on this. Uh, the American Institute of Physics had the team up task force that worked and they have a guidelines and best practices. Um, SACNAS, uh, which is uh, for Chicano students, the uh, there's a, uh, uh, I apologize, I'm not going to be good with some of these organizations, a plant organization, physiology, there's another biology one, some neuroscience ones. Um, there's also, you know, centers, you know, across universities across the nation that have provided tools that we can use within our departments. Uh, there's one at the uh, University of South Carolina, uh, not, <laughs> not uh, Southern California, that is a uh, is a very intensive, you know, self, you know, self-guided workshop for departments or college units to uh, work together on building better DEI environments within your institution. And uh, one of the things I'll highlight on here is the fairplaygame.org. It's actually a really good online simulator tool for understanding uh, implicit bias in terms of advising. And uh, you know, both uh, national academies and AAAS are also providing lots of resources. Uh, the uh, uh, National Academies, they're doing, I think, it's weekly episodes on uh, webinars on you know, various issues involving what we're talking about here. And I think that uh, we would all benefit the more all of us listen to this and learn from it. And then meanwhile, we will continue to work to get the survey done and uh, hopefully be providing the data from it to you all in the near future. And that's it from our group. And I just want to thank our group again. Uh, it's been uh, very productive and I'm excited that we're going to continue to keep on working. Great. Thank you, Jason. And um, we do want to open this up following each of the presentations. If there are any questions or comments, uh, we've built in some time. So you can either type them in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself for, for a moment and ask the question. And I will stop sharing while we do the questions. Uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you. This is Madhvi. I want to thank the committee who worked on this. Uh, a great job. And I think I really agree that once we collect more information with the survey that uh, the questions that you put up as uh, that would go into the survey, it will be very uh, um, helpful for us because for us to know why we are losing people, to do something about that, we can't do till we understand. So I think that's a great start. And I think that uh, uh, that will tell us a lot. My other question was that, Jason, you showed all those links, right? But my biggest worry is that we, we have access to all those links and um, it's finding the time to constantly go to those places and make sure. So it's not like we don't want undergraduates, right? We are just trying to figure out how can, what can we do to retain them? You know, why are we losing them? So it's very nice to have those links, but I mean, more, most of us have more things to do than we have time for. So we, if we have these concrete steps that would enable us, uh, that would be more helpful. Uh, because like you said, most uh, organizations have, and in fact, even right state is having a whole series on diversity and inclusion. And the, I had everybody in my department sign up for that. We can start with that since right state is already doing that and encourage our faculty to join those uh, run by CTL to begin with. So that's just my comments. Thank hey, you, Jason. Dr. Hey, Jason, how yes. are how are the surveys going to be 
administered because like if it goes out mass, I feel like we're going to miss a lot of people. <laughs> I'm just saying that I know that a lot of times I, I don't know. Just do you have an idea how you want to do that? I think we discussed this um, already. I'm trying to, if anybody else in the group is on there, can you remember what we came up with? Or was that a, the, we're going to figure that out when we have a survey ready to go? <laughs> uh, so this is Deborah Steele Johnson. I can probably address this to some extent. Uh, so, so we certainly, so we've offered to assist in running this through developing the IRB petition and um, administering the survey and collecting the data our students know how to set it up in Qualtrics. So our idea would be to provide students with a link that they could go to. Now, what we don't know is what is the best way to identify uh, people to send the survey link to. So, I mean, we could go through the um, Belinga and some of the other organizations, the DEI organizations, if anybody has any suggestions on how to develop the survey invite list, I'm confident our committee would be very open to that. Would this go just to this will go just to Wright State folks, right, Deborah? Yes. Yes. So I had done Wright State Wright State URMs. Right. So I had actually worked with the. Uh, a group in Kola who, who, who actually, that's all they do, design surveys. So I had uh, run a task force for School of Medicine Research, and it was so helpful to have yeah. them help me. I knew what questions I wanted, but the trick to design a survey, so it takes minimal time for the person to respond to the Qualtech survey and the design of the questions. Uh, I learned a lot during that process, and if you guys want, I can throw a name to you. If you I, I appreciate that. I'm very familiar with that organization. I know people over that in that organization, and they do very fine work. That also happens to be a substantial portion of the training we provide to our IO graduate students. So our IO graduate students are, this is what they go out and get jobs doing. So uh, the, the person I that think we already... Name was Carol, I forget the last name. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm very familiar with those people. Again, they do great work. Um, I, I believe we actually have the expertise we need here. I might reach out to them in terms of if they've got a good list for URMs across campus. But. What is the name of that organization in COLA? I think it's called COOPA. Um, Center for something like Urban Planning Administration, something like that. I can look it up for you if you so if some of you are interested in this organization, I can um, send you I can find the link to them and send it to you in chat. Thanks, Deb. That's great. Any other questions for the underrepresented minority group? Okay. Hearing none, we will move on to our gateway course group. Uh, and this group looked at um, you know, what we can do in our gateway courses to strengthen them and to um, help students better succeed. So Dr. Richoaga um, led this group, uh, Dr. Chad Campbell. We had several students, Colin Davis, Walt Jima, and Nate Mack were in this group, as well as Dr. Lisa Kenyon from um, our biology department and CTL, Michelle Newsom and Courtney Smith participated in this. So I will turn it over to that group. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, this is, uh, uh, we looked at gateway courses. So first thing we wanna do is uh, define what gateway courses are. Well, these are really important. They're, most of students who come into the university will have mostly gateway courses in their, um, in their studies. So these are generally defined as introductory level courses that the students take before they can move on to the more major specific courses. And for the purpose of our group the that we looked at are introductory courses in biology, in chemistry, and 
in physics. So the issue that uh, the our focus group looked at is that gateway courses seem to pose an obstacle to student success rather than uh, acting as springboard so then they can move on to what they really want to do when they start their majors. Well, this is not only a problem in our university, it's a problem nationwide, and many institutions are, are working on how to, to resolve this issue. And of course, we want to be one of those institutions to see what's going on with the gateway courses. Next slide, please. Okay, well, the first step is to see what's going on out there. So we looked at a lot of literature that the college had uh, provided us and some members of the team, faculty members have provided us. And this is a little bit of a summary of what we found out. So first, it is very helpful to deliver classroom help to the students in addition to the existing success centers already. And we have that here at Wright State. Some of the gateway courses utilize undergraduate TAs and LAs in their lectures. So that's a good thing. Uh, utilizing or giving an offerings of active learning courses is also found to be helpful. And we do have sections in Bio 1210, Bio 1120, and Physics 2400 that offer those uh, active learning courses. The other thing is that it is good to minimize the time for the students to complete the gateway courses because they might lose interest if they're spending so much time doing this gateway courses and aren't and aren't successful. So it's very important for retention math app to do this. Uh, they have an algebra course where you can take the developmental course for that as a core requisite. And then we also, it will also be helpful if we can assess the course readiness of the students before they start with that uh, course and then provide them a means to improve on that course already. So CHEM 1210 uses the Alex as software to do that. And then there's also suggestions that maybe we would like to consider an approach which is more teaching and less grading or different kind of grading uh, to help the, the students adjust without sacrificing the learning that they're having in class. Okay, so we already know that the success in gateway courses will affect retention. And we wanted to look at other factors that may also be affecting retention. We went from their high school backgrounds, such as high school GPA, uh, ACT score, we looked at the effect of ethnicity, we looked at socioeconomic factors, uh, the median household in income in the high school that they're at, we looked at unmet need based on the FAFSA, we look at the effect of having, of being enrolled in an active learning class, we also said, oh, maybe this bio and chem are so difficult. Maybe it's affecting their performance in gateway classes. So we looked at that too. We looked at how many courses they have taken in the past and how many credit hours they're also taking while they are taking a gateway course. Is the number of credit hours affecting the way they are performing in this gateway courses? So we looked at the effect of that on retention. We also looked at the effect of that on the success in each of the gateway courses. This is um, a summary of the result that we got, the effect of success in gateway course on the retention of the students. So basically we asked who still enrolled the following fall semester after taking a gateway course. So if you look at, let's just focus on that second column there so we can understanding of this data. So for example, for bio 1120, 93% of the students who got an A enrolled again. 84% of the students who got a B were retained, 78% of the students who got a C were retained. 48 students who did, those who did, this is, this is the retention um, for them. 48% of those who did not succeed were retained. So this, this, for example, shows us that if they succeed in gateway courses, we get them going back to the those um those who who other means the 
use. So those who do not um, who are not successful are not are not retained. There's only 48% of them that are retained in biology. You can see the same th trend if you go through all the gateway courses um, that we looked at. I think the only uh, different things here are for physics 1120 and physics 1120L, where the uh, there's really no statistical difference uh, that we can make if it affects if the success in physics 1120 and 1120L is affecting um, their retention. But for most of the courses, that's what we see. Success in the gateway courses is important for retention, higher grade. There's just a higher probability of retaining them, but of course we're not recommending that just give them high grades. It's we want them um, to learn. We want to find ways in order to help them succeed in this gateway courses. These are the success ratios in gateway courses and what factors are affecting their success. Let's focus on bio 1120, for example. The percent of students who passed the course, 71%. Those who did not pass the course, 29%. In Chem 1210, 61% of them passed, 39% did not. Chem 1220 is, is on the extreme, only 56% of the students passed, 44% of the students did not pass. And you can, you can keep going and just see that data uh, for yourselves. We also looked at, well, what are the factors affecting the success of the students? Let's go to bio again, just because it's on the very, uh, this is the very first course there. So high school GPA is affecting their success, ACT scores affecting them. So higher GPA, higher ACT scores, higher probability of success. We also, uh, the prior hours they have taken in the university, also the higher the um, hours they have taken before, the higher is the probability that they will succeed in a gateway course. We also found this interesting, that the current hours that they're enrolled in is affecting their success. We thought it will be the opposite, but what we found is that the more credit hours they're enrolled in, the better they are in performing in those gateway um, courses. If you look at Chem 1210, there's really a lot of factors that's affecting the success of the students. So this is something that the chemistry department might probably look at. Across the board, you will see from here that the high school GPA is, is an important factor. We, of course, cannot do anything um, about that, but there's other factors like the current hours they're, they're enrolled um, in also seems to, to be affecting that. The next slide. Oh, uh, I forgot to say, we, we also evaluated in Chem 1210. In Chem 1210, we have an offering of active learning and non-active learning. And we also found that those involved in the active learning club will have um, more success in that Chem um, 1210. And there's no other course where we can evaluate the difference between active learning and non-active learning. So we don't have that data for other courses. So now the question, do we go um, from here? And I'm going to turn it over to Chad, who will talk about some of the suggestions that the group has come up with. So go ahead and advance the slide, please. All right. So. Um, we were tasked with trying to figure out what some short-term, uh, mid-term, and long-term solutions would be. Um, so on the short-term solutions, uh, we had noticed that almost universally, uh, the students' uh, grades in their particular gateway courses had an impact on retaining those students. So we figured a lot of our short-term solutions should be on uh, providing aid or help to those students who are struggling in these courses. So uh, one of our thoughts was adding just-in-time tutoring or recitations for lower performing students to help them. Uh, this is all supported by the literature. Um, so uh, adding an extra recitation for students can help them with studying and getting to know uh, their material a little bit better, uh, interacting with TAs, interacting with LAs, et cetera. 
Uh, but if recitations are not possible, um, you can actually require LAs, uh, TAs, or other tutoring sessions. So students who are not doing well, potentially after the first exam, such as a D or lower, might be required to then attend those TA or LA hours as a part of their grade um, to help bolster their study time, their understanding of material, et cetera. Um, so who would be in charge of this? Uh, it would be basically the departmental curriculum committees or teaching faculty that would need to uh, recruit those LAs or obtain those TAs. Uh, and and kind of get them into those classrooms to help those students uh, full time. Uh, and then changing program requirements to accept LA hours for students might help. Uh, I know in uh, BMB, we offer uh, BMB 3990 for our LAs and they can use those credits towards their degree. It's a limited amount that they're allowed to do, but some students are willing to sign up and say, hey, I'm actually really interested in teaching other students. I wanna know more about this material. I wanna go more in depth. But then I also want to get some credit for it. So that's been successful for us. Uh, another thing we've thought about is uh, incorporating uh, study test taking skills for a particular subject into gateway courses. So in talking to some of our students, uh, students coming from high school into college have a hard time with that transition. Uh, in high school, they tend to do very, very well and need uh, not to do so much uh, studying. So when they get into college, it kind of blows them away that suddenly there's this huge amount of material and they need to learn how to study. So uh, something that might help is to take some time in these gateway courses to teach students how to learn the material. Um, each subject may have unique content that might require specific study skills, uh, mathematical solving skills, or uh, the use of some programs online, whatever it is that you know, us faculty know are you know, tried and true uh, ways to study our material might help the students because they might not know these things yet. So who would do this? Obviously the faculty teaching the courses or the departmental curriculum committees can help here in the development of these types of resources for our students. Go ahead and advance. So beyond that, uh, another thing we can look at is reevaluating our course grading or course grading percentages. So we can look at how are we grading our students. Um, so the literature shows that low stress testing with a lot of feedback is shown to help students improve over the long term. Uh, that just doesn't mean we grade their tests and give them some information back and they ignore it. It means they have to then do something with the feedback. So they get the feedback and then, you know, for partial credit, they can return their exams. They can return their homework with improvement, showing that they've seen the feedback. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, more frequent assessment increases student engagement. Um, so it's shown that doing multiple exams over a semester as opposed to one or two exams within a semester actually increases engagement for students. It also helps us with identifying students who are struggling early on. So having an exam in the first two or three weeks of the course would be more beneficial than just having a midterm and having the students find out only halfway through that they're not doing that well in the course. Uh, so this is again uh, shown in uh, the literature all over the place. Uh, furthermore, using only exams as grading criteria can provide inaccurate assessment of student knowledge. So uh, it's known that students sometimes struggle under these high stakes testing um, circumstances and environments. So providing other methods for them to show that they have the knowledge that you're looking for is important. You can do portfolios, reports, um, just general homework, problem sets, those types of things. Uh, and this is uh, doubly so if standardized tests are being used. So if you're using national tests, sometimes this is a problem because uh, these standardized tests are very difficult and students just aren't prepared for them. Uh, and of course, teaching faculty and departmental curriculum committees can help here as well, trying to figure out, you know, how can we redesign these courses quickly in order to, you know, help the students learn the material. And then finally, um, as we're seeing that, um, the amount of credits that students are taking may have a dependence upon how well they succeed. Uh, it might help to promote students to register as full-time or even additional credits beyond 12, perhaps to 15, uh, because it seems more hours correlates with retention. Um, so advisors might be able to help here. Um, we can do perhaps some college outreach, uh, letting students know that um, registering for 15 credits is actually um, making each dollar worth more money because the tuition cost doesn't change from 12. I believe it's up to 18 credits. So um, that's something that we can do as well is just get them to know taking more keeps you busier, keeps you involved. You don't have time to, to goof off basically. And that kind of helps you stay focused and, and do well in your courses.
All right, Rachel, I believe you're taking over here. Lisa is on the call. I believe Lisa Kenyon, are you still with us? Maybe not. So, uh, Rachel, did you want to go through these for on Lisa's okay, behalf? Yeah, if, if Lisa isn't here, Lisa, if you're here, just let us know and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, so these are the uh, proposed mid range solutions that the group uh, came up with. So, we said that it's important to deliver that help to the students in addition to this uh, success centers because just getting the help there. Um, I guess students are so busy that they sometimes they, they might not have time to look for these other resources. So strengthening this classroom help is going to be uh, very important. One of the ways, we, these are some of the ways that they, we can strengthen that UTA and LA program that we have in place. We said, okay, we can provide some centralized training for the UTAs and LAs, and we can partner with CTL in providing this uh, training. We can coordinate this uh, LA efforts with the tutoring and and uh, the SI in the student success. So um, see how we can we can strengthen the support of those two different uh, possibilities. We want to create an evaluation process for the UTAs and LAs. We can utilize their feedback and testimonials in order to improve further on on this uh, programs. Uh, since there was some evidence that active learning uh, might be helping uh, the students succeed better in these gateway courses, uh, we want to propose a partnership with uh, CTL so that we can provide professional development for instructors who might be interested in doing active learning. We can consider creating a credential or certification for active learning trained instructors. Uh, we can do a symposium to highlight the teaching strategies for other for other instructors. Bio 1120 has active learning during the summer semester and uh, perhaps offering this during normal semesters uh, might be good. It, we don't have data to support that bioactive learning is, is better than bio non-active learning, but maybe if we just start offering this, then we can uh, look at that data. Same thing with 1150 also. Uh, we don't have active learning in Chem 1220. It might be good to have that active learning format in 1220, also to provide continuity for those in Gen Chem 1 active learning, and then they go to Gen Chem 2 active learning. Uh, format also. Uh, we might consider having a maximum for the class sizes that we have, perhaps 150, 180. We set that uh, as the maximum. And of course, we want to keep working on the previous solutions that um, we set up before. Michelle, your turn. Okay, got you. It's interesting, I just saw in the chat that somebody asked about um, class size, and that may actually go into maybe some short-term or long-term solutions. Um, the first thing our people, when we went to set up the long-term, like we don't even know where to start because we don't have enough data, just like some of the other people. So we wanna do a science attitude survey. Um, we know that attitude um, will, infect, will affect enrollment choice. Um, so our gateway courses have basically two goals, to give the basic concept so that they can go on in their education. But the second goal is to develop a positive attitude towards science. And if we're not doing that, then we're losing them. And this is all based on, um, I've already started looking at some things for the from the Journal of Research on Science Teaching and JCMED. So that leads into figuring out what they already think about the science and then how we can maybe even change that. Now they do come from high school already with their attitudes. The research says that. So it's sort of like we have an uphill battle, so to speak. 
Um, we want to suggest that maybe we redesign some of the courses so that we have better alignment between learning objectives, learning objectives, some um, teaching strategies that are based on educational research and assessment techniques. Um, Rachel already alluded to the fact, and the reason we put it in long term because it may take some time to actually, maybe it'll take a year to get there where we give some continuity to some of our students. This actually stemmed from some of the student interviews that we did. And they were saying that it was hard to go from the active learning to the non-active learning, or it was hard to go from something um, that they learned or in freshman year and then had to relearn it again. And the way it was taught was way different later. So they liked some continuity. Um, and we didn't put bio in that because bio right now, from what we understand, the two bio courses are not really sequential. But we would suggest that they um, maybe try to get more continuity in their bio courses also. And um, we need to figure out a process sort of like um, the URM people, like why, who's leaving and why are they leaving? And we don't know how to do that. We have some questions that we still need to come up with. Next slide. So um, the other thing we've already mentioned, we want to continue this, evaluate the student readiness for the Gateway course. Um, I do this in Kim 1210 with Alex. I know Math uses Alex um, because research says that if they have to start out in intro courses, that we sometimes lose them before they even get to what we are considering the gateway course. So, but we don't wanna set them up for failure. So that's why we need to evaluate and maybe make that across the board and cause them somehow. Um, identify, we need to come up with some questions, identify what and how to collect the qualitative data to improve the instruction. Um, this may be concept inventories. Chad um, recently uploaded a bunch of those to our team site. So we're going to start looking through those attitude surveys. We have to figure out what these kids are thinking. Students, sorry. And then um, even though COVID has sort of not been ideal, it has opened up some opportunities for people maybe that didn't have those opportunities before. And we would suggest that we have to examine those, like maybe hybrid course offerings need to stay around for some of the people so that they can stay enrolled in the, in the program. So that's what we suggest. Rachel. Thank you. Yep. Uh, oh, I was just gonna say if there's a, uh, any questions the chat group has been or the chat box has been quite active during this presentation uh, i do want to address one of the questions and that why was math not included in this analysis um, our math department in this group did look at that and the math department has been doing quite a bit of uh, work on these ideas over the last several years and they um, looked at the the co-requisite model. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I do encourage you to reach out to Dr. Sahin uh, with that. Um, and we focused on the gateway courses that most um, science and math students have to take. Uh, so that's why EES was not included in this either, um, because most science math students have to take the chem, the bio, and, and possibly the physics. So that's why those were chosen along with the math and because the math has been um, so examined and quite a few changes have been happening. That's why those were excluded. Any other broad questions for this group? Um, yes, I have one if I could. Yes, Scott. Um, so I, I question the interpretation of the number of current hours enrolled for. Um, I suspect that the number of hours enrolled for is reflective of how many outside non-academic commitments students have. So if a student is enrolled in few hours, it may be that they are working full time to support themselves. 
So how does encouraging them to enroll for more help them or had, did the did the committee even look at that possibility? Data um, on, go ahead, Rachel. I can agree uh, with your point because one of the issues we said also, okay, those students have a full-time load because this might be the serious students to begin with already. And so they, they have more potential for uh, success already. If we wanna look at other uh, factors, I think that's a different kind of study to really, to really um, make an assessment of that. And we have to think how to remove all the other factors that might be affecting it. But I, I, I definitely agree with you. It's just that maybe to begin with, they, they are the serious um, students also already, but perhaps encouraging them to be full-time um, students will also will also help, and of course, this is where we need uh, uh, to to talk about students how how to balance their work and studies and so on. So it's not just the gateway course. Yes, we want to work with the first year seminar. We want to work with with coaching and mentoring. I think this is not just a solution for the gateway course. Yeah, I, I have a little bit of a problem with the characterization of full-time students as the serious ones. Just because somebody has to work to support themselves doesn't mean they're serious about their academic pursuits. That's a good point. Uh, and the other piece is that we did not have data on um, what their other commitments are outside of classes. So we could only uh, look at the data on how many enrolled courses or how many hours they were enrolled in for that term. Eric, did you have a question, Eric Bennett? Yeah, uh, I, I find the 1210, 1220 active versus non-active learning thing data really, really fascinating. And I'm encouraged to see Michelle is going to offer the 1220 uh, active uh, also to, to try to see if the trend continues as they move through. But I'm curious, has the analysis been done since, since we haven't previously had a 1220 active learning? Has the analysis been done whether the active 1210 learners do as well as the non active 1210 learners in 1220? Uh, so I don't know if anybody can answer that question or not. Mike, do you want to? Or Rachel? I'm not aware of a 1220 active learning section. No, no, that's my point. I, my, my point is, is if you actively learn in 1210, and you've done better in 1210, does that trend continue in 1220 or you do, do you revert back to the same performance as the non-active 1210 learners in 1220? Or do you do worse in 1220 than the non-active learners in 1210? That's kind of my question. Because that sets us up as do we have to do the whole curricul curriculum active or, you know, or what? It, it adds a lot to the analysis, I think. Yeah, and we did, uh, this is Mike, we did take a look at that and we did not see a difference between going from active to non-active or non-active to non-active. But it's only a partial story since we have no idea what happens to students who take non-active 1210 and go to an active 1220. Um, and additionally, we only have one person teaching the, the active learning section. So we would need a much um, more robust sample size to look at that. But that was a follow up question that we had, because one of the students specifically said that students, other students in his class were complaining about transitioning from one style of teaching to another. But we just don't have a lot of data available at the different styles at the moment. OK, great. But you didn't you did it. You at least did not see worse performance in 12 in the non active 1220 by the active 1210 learners. Is that correct? Correct. That that's why we looked at it, because we were afraid that that was that was going on, but we did not see evidence of that. No, well, that's a good sign, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is a great conversation and would love to continue it, but we do have two more uh, presentations to get through and I want to be respective of, of everyone's time. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will introduce Dr. Sylvia Newell and her team, Dr. Travis Clark, Rob Cowles, Ryan Elam, uh, Dr. Giovanna Fallo from uh, our Lake Campus. So it was nice to have uh, Giovanna with us. Uh, Dr. John Pietta, uh, Eric Potts and Matt Skira uh, participated in the first year seminar conversation. So I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Newell. All right, uh, next slide. So 
in the larger question of how do we retain students, we were trying to evaluate the effectiveness of our current first year seminars, try to decide are first year seminars helping? Are they worth it? We have a lot of different kinds of first year seminars. We have our departmental seminars currently in BMB, neurophysics, EES. Um, we have the pre-health seminars, and then UVC also has various kinds of seminars that we mostly ended up lumping together. Next slide. So we were trying to figure out for COSM, do the first year student or first year seminars improve our retention rates for the following fall? So our students who take a departmental first year seminar more likely to be retained than students who take no first year seminar or a university first year seminar. And our students who take a university first year seminar are more likely to be retained than those who take none. So in other words, does any first year seminar do or does it help to be taking a departmental specific seminar or does it not matter whether you take one at all? And to that extent, Mike Bottomley did all of the stats for us. So I'm going to turn this over to him and then I'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, what's going on currently. Okay, so this slide is basically a summary of the results by our different groups. So there are three existing departmental first year seminars, one in BNB, one in uh, neuroscience, and one in physics. And then the university is a combination of UH 1010, which are honor students, and UVC 1010. And then our final group is those who took no seminar their first semester. So this is new direct from high school COSM students. So we can see that the department seminars other than physics and the no seminar are in the mid to high 60s. Uh, physics is at 92. There's only 24 students, but it's at 92. Honor students are at 93. Uh, one thing that we did that I should mention is there could be inherent differences between these students since they're self-selecting what their major is, and one of the groups is honor students. So we use propensity score matching, which to be very brief, just finds the closest set of identical twins between different groups. So we can try to eliminate any underlying biases in the data set and be more um, confident about our results. So there were 105 total students in the department first year seminars. Each of those were matched with two students from a university seminar and two students from no seminar. So there's 210 in the university seminar group and there's 210 in the no and there's 105 in the department. All right, next slide. So our major finding is currently only a trend. Um, it had a p-value of 0 0.08. So if you use a 0 0.05 cutoff, it's, it's in the ballpark, it's not quite there. 105 is not a large sample size. And we're also only looking at three department seminars out of, I think, a total of eight. But the plot shows the trends in the data. And if, if, is, if this is real, then it's, it's likely very important. So the blue line is the department first year seminar students. The red line are the students that took none. So this plot is specifically for department seminar versus no seminar. The vertical axis is the probability of coming back to right state the next fall. So we can see at the lower GPAs, uh, below 3.75 roughly, the seminar is more effective at retention for um, students than those who took no seminar. And as the high school GPA increases, those differences sort of, sort of even out, and then descriptively the nun creeps ahead above the 4.0 range. So if we're looking at the students coming in with low high school GPAs, it could be beneficial they take a department seminar. Yes. Oh, sorry, I thought someone uh, had a question. So then we hey, looked at Jason, department. Hey, Jason asked, which years is it from this data? I believe it is 2015 through 2019. So the 2019 year, meaning we the tw their registration in 2020 would be the cutoff, but it was students who took courses in 2019. Yeah, that is correct. Yes. All right. So then we looked at DFS department versus university. We saw a really similar trend. It was more pronounced in the upper end of it. And our concern was though the UH, sorry, the, the university seminar is made up of both honor students and UVC students. The honor students do not exist at the lower high school GPAs. So we thought they were throwing things off at the upper end. And also from our descriptive slide, we can see that 93% of the honor students stick around. 
So not surprisingly, the honor students have high high school GPAs and they have great retention rates. So we were concerned that it wasn't a fair comparison to include them. So then we specifically looked at department versus UVC 1010 and that interaction, that trend disappeared. There was no significant difference in retention rates between the two seminar types. There was still a strong association between increased high school GPAs and increased retention. Next slide, please. And then lastly, we looked at the university first year seminar, again, excluding the honors from our prior experience, thinking they're just overly biasing the data set. We can't account for it. So we only looked at UBC 1010 versus the um, no seminar. There was no evidence of all groups combined. We looked at the years individually, since there have been a variety of challenges um, at Wright State for each of the given years. And we had the sample size to do it. We didn't have the sample size to do it in the prior comparisons with the department seminars, but here we had 480 per group. So I, re I ran the matching algorithm again, since we have many more students in these two groups. So there's 480 in each, each of these groups for this analysis. What we did find, none of the years were different except for the 2018 to 2019 retention, which is where the UVC 1010 students were more likely to be retained. Descriptively, it was 66% for them relative to 52% for those um, who did not take a seminar, which overlaps the, the strike in the spring of 2019, which may or may not be relevant. So overall, as from an exploratory standpoint, initial steps, between this result in the strike here and the department versus no seminar at the lower high school GPAs, we have some evidence pointing in the direction of these seminars being impactful specifically for at-risk students. And that's it for the analysis. All right, Chad. All right, so uh, this slide kind of gives a little breakdown of what the BMB 1000 freshman seminar looks like. Um, so just to kind of talk about how mine might be different than uh, what you might see in a UVC or, or a university honors seminar um, and why it's more departmental specific. Um, so one of the things we do is we work on the myths of science. It's a, a great publication that came out in the, the mid 2000s and it focuses on various aspects of scientific practices and talks about uh, how general media and uh, just general lay conceptions view what a scientist does and this kind of debunks them and then goes through you know talking about why we're you know not as we're depicted on television all the time uh, one of the main ones being you know that we're working alone in a lab all by ourselves you know late at night it, so it kind of gets into how you know we're very collaborative and, and we work a lot with each other and we're dependent upon other people's research etc uh, so they'll read those and then they submit questions. We do a lot of uh, discussion in class about these different myths. Uh, other things we do is uh, we have substantial time on assisting with the adjustment to university life. Uh, so we do university procedures, academic expectations, strategies for academic success, career questions. I'll show them things like uh, degree audit system. I'll talk to them about the library. We'll get them involved with Engage, which is the student activity program. Um, we'll talk about all the different things going on on campus. Uh, the one year I actually took the class over to the fall uh, COSM, uh, I guess it was the social get together, just trying to get them engaged and uh, on campus available so that they know what's available to them. Um, and that's I brought in Rob Cowles and I brought in uh, Meredith talking about ask. So just kind of getting them to know what resources are available to them on campus. Uh, another big part of what we do is we develop uh, a learner centered portfolio. So this is a portfolio they work on through all four years uh, and we start this first class with pre assessments. Um, so I use uh, a battery of about seven different assessments on anything from content knowledge to motivation to self efficacy, etc. Uh, and then we track that over the four years and have them take it again when they graduate to see. Uh, have they learned the content? Have they changed their motivations? Is their self-efficacy changing? And, you know, it kind of gives the students uh, a, a good feather in their cap to say, look how much I've grown, but it also gives our program a good assessment to say, wow, okay, these are the places we're doing well, or, ooh, we're not hitting this. How can we change things to get here? Um, all right, and then they have a final reflective essay and oral presentation. So science communication is a big part of being a scientist. So this is kind of my first hit on how do they present information? And it's very informal at this point. 
Uh, the second semester, we move into something that's more scientific, but it just kind of gets them up and used to talking. And then it talks about the class, the things that they liked, the things that they didn't like, so that the next year I can adjust the class. Uh, so how they make it through the class is they have to achieve a 70% or better to pass. Um, graded activities include class participation. Uh, out of class assignments would be journaling about the readings that they have to do. Um, portfolio development, which is those assessments and of course their final project. Um, the one thing I didn't talk about is I also go through the different scientific practices from the next generation science standards with them. So asking questions, you know, um, working with mathematical models, et cetera. And we just kind of talk about what those things are and I have them read the NGSS brief so that they kind of get an idea of what these practices are and what they should have gotten through their uh, elementary all the way through high school education. And, and students talk about how well their high schools did versus didn't do. And it's engaging. They enjoy talking about it. And, and it's kind of a, a low stakes class, but it really kind of gets them into uh, college as you will. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Next slide. Patrick, are you here? Yeah, I am. Sorry. Uh, I'm in the midst of dealing with furnace issues, so it's a little chaotic here, but yes, I am here. Uh, so yeah, our, our first year seminar actually is fairly similar um, in many regards to what Chad presented for uh, the first year seminar of BMB. Um, we, we do a lot of things in order to help the students um, adjust to collegiate academic uh, life and kind of how to be successful students. Uh, because it's already been pointed out, in many cases, students in high school may not have to study or spend the time doing coursework outside of class uh, that they absolutely will have to do to be successful in uh, undergrad. So we talk about things like that. We talk about the degree audit system, very similar to what Chad was talking about. Um, and we also get into some, you know, preparatory things for um, getting involved in research, introducing them to um, opportunities available to them on campus. Um, for uh, research-based activities. Um, we do a lot of different social things, both in and out of class, uh, to try to you know, help them become part of the broader neuroscience community on campus. Um, one thing that I think is, is pretty important too during that point in time, because our course is A-term only, is making sure that they are um, not only familiar with the degree audit system, but also how to look up classes, how to figure out a plan for next semester and beyond. And we actually have them create, um, you know, a, a graduation planning strategy specific to them, taking into account majors, minors, all that stuff. Um, and then I go over them all and give them feedback with it. And um, over the years, those will come back and, hey, I've made edits to these. Can you take a look at it, um, et cetera? So it's, a, it's, I think, a pretty useful tool for the students. But otherwise, I'd say overall, a lot of it is fairly similar to uh, what Chad uh, presented. Thanks, Pat. Kathy? Okay, did not know I was presenting today. <laughs> um, it's your slide, I can read it if you want. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Um, my, it's, it's funny because in, in Neuro, we basically have several different, very small credit hour classes that originally were all one, but, but it was clear that it was too much work um, in any given semester, but I've, I've honed down to, to an incredible set of books, um, one of which isn't listed here, but is The New Science of Learning and The Art of Possibility. And these are books that are about personal development, as well as using the, the research of neuroscience to understand the best ways to learn, which includes the um, distributed practice, which I saw mentioned in the chat, and includes things like getting enough sleep and getting enough exercise and how these things are helping you learn. And we know that through neuroscience, like exercise increases brain derived neurotrophic factor in your brain. So honing in on their interest in neuroscience, but as well as teaching them ways of learning that are not rote and that will um, increase their success going forward.
All right, so this is the first year that we did a, a seminar in EES, which is why it wasn't included in the data set. And this was a class co-taught by Chad Hammerschmidt, who's our department chair and myself. And we followed the approach of some of the earlier classes that we've talked about here and that we had a book that we talked about. We used the story of more, which is a pretty lay version of climate change and the students really liked it. Instead of focusing on um, more skills about being a general student, though, we kind of just focused on issues with climate change and current events. And it was a pretty informal class and the students seemed to like the informalness the best, actually. So mostly they had to read a chapter and then we talked about that. They had to turn in questions about the chapter and a current event before every class. And then we just chatted about that, but we opened up tangents. But the one class that I wasn't there and Chad took over, he let them just have like a general conversation, a free for all, asking him questions about like how he got to be where he was and stuff like that. And they loved it. A lot of them commented in the end that that was their favorite class. So, you know, maybe keeping them on topic is not the best thing actually. And the feedback from them was overwhelmingly extremely positive. They liked it so much. They actually wanted to keep meeting this semester as a lunch group because they liked having the interaction and feeling like they had that connection within the department. So I'm hoping that it will continue to be successful. Next slide. I think this keeps on with me. Oh, no. All right, go ahead, Eric. Hi, everybody. Um, so my seminar, I've taught a couple different ones, but they're all basically a student success seminar. I've taught for the College of Engineering. I've taught for COSM. And this semester, I had a combined COSM and engineering first year seminar. Um, so as you can see, it's a lot of what Chad talked about. You know, how do you be successful as a student? You know, we talk about connecting them to Wright State. We actually have what we call co-curriculars and the general UVC uh, first year seminars where we would make students go to different events across campus. And then the goal, of course, is to connect them to campus. I took it one step further and had them go to diversity related events, something that's out of their comfort zone if they're willing, if they're comfortable. Um, I would have them go to something in their department or their major, something that's related to careers, not just all basketball games. Um, but besides that, we're trying to help them be successful, learn student skills, study skills, communication, emails. We ed educate them about Wright State's resources on campus. Like Chad, we do the engage for student organizations. And I try to highlight COSM stuff. Um, we have them go to the library. We have the advisors come in and talk to them so they know about that degree audit report and stuff like that which is now you achieve. <laughs> um, we do some um, career exploration. I have Ashley Hill Mercer and Rob ha Cowles come in and we have groups separate. Um, I do experiential learning like with Chad. I have Meredith Rogers come in and present on the program and the opportunities in their departments and in the college. So for me, I'm a general seminar, so I'm trying to get them connected to their departments and to cause them as a whole, I don't have that advantage of like Sylvia and Chad and Pat and all them have of being a department seminar. Um, but I do have upper class students come in, successful students come in to present. They love that. Um, I've had Scott Baird come in, you know, about undergraduate research as well. Um, it's a really general class, as you can see there. It's not very structured. I agree with Sylvia. Don't be afraid to go off book. And the biggest thing that I have to say is, it's not a, a regular class where you have a set schedule and a lecture. It's just, let's talk, let's have discussion, let's have debate, let's explore, let's think about ourselves and who we are, you know, and who COSM is and what a scientist is and such like that. So it's a really neat course that I've taught it for six years now and uh, students have generally really liked it. Um, so yeah, it's been fun being part of the group. Thanks so much, Eric. All right, so, I mean, as you heard overall, our basic themes involved focusing on a book. A lot of them do basic survival skills. Um, I, something I'd like to see more of is this attendance of departmental events when we have them again. Um, next slide. And actually just next slide. It's running out of time. But in general, we recommend that every department in COSM has a first year seminar starting next year and that we run them for three years. Given the almost 
um, 0.05 significant data that we had, we think that it really will help our struggling students. And it's just a question of having a big enough sample size to prove that. But so that's our recommendation. Um, we're going to work with CTNL this spring to develop um, first year seminar pilot shells and instruction techniques so that people who start teaching them in the fall will have that as a resource. And we also plan to have a, um, a webinar with them to try to help them get it set up. And then in the fall, we'd like to have a regular meeting time of all the department first year seminar teachers to discuss best practices, but also to work with Giovanna on a survey of the students that will happen at the end of the fall to examine how effective they've been. Next slide. So then we recommend that in three years, we rerun those stats with our bigger sample size and look at the survey results and see um, whether or not we think these are successful, but in a broader sense, not just are they being retained or not, but you know, did they foster a sense of development or departmental belonging or feeling, et cetera? So, okay, I, we've gone way over time, so I'm gonna stop now. Thank you very much. I do wanna give time if there are a couple questions and then we'll get to our final group on coaching and mentoring. Sylvia, real quick, um, the BMB, um, freshman seminar is a 0 0.5 credit hour class. I was wondering if you looked at that compared to any of the one credit hour classes and if there was a difference in retention at all, or if the, the half one was doing the same or if more time would be better, what do you think? We did not look at that largely because we don't have enough data for it to be a big enough sample size. However, I think it actually would be better if it were a semester long, just based on my own experience teaching it now, because I think that having it be consistent through the semester helps foster that um, feeling of belonging of departmental camaraderie. Anybody else? Great. We've got one final group, and I will turn it over to Dr. Audrey McGowan, uh, who led the one on coaching and mentoring. Uh, she was helped with, by Dr. Paula uh, Baboya, Gail Clevin, Dr. Ivan Medvedev, uh, Rebecca Reese, and Bridget Siever. Uh, you can, okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of benefits to mentoring students and faculty. But one thing we know, we do not have the luxury of letting students slip through the cracks. Um, we have to step back a minute and take a look at the whole person here when we talk about mentoring and coaching. So some of the benefits, of course, is improved self-worth. Also, fostering an identity as a scientist. But one of the most important things is for students to have a sense of belonging. And if they don't make that connection, they're going to drift away from us. We want them to feel good about learning and establish relationships with faculty. We want them to grow in their profession, learn about the profession. Um, of course, we want to increase our retention and we also would like to have increased work satisfaction for faculty. We want faculty to feel like they're engaged and it matters that they show up for work every day. So we can look at the ideas of coaching and mentoring. Coaching tends to be more short-term relationships, just to focusing, focusing on a particular skill, like maybe study skills, uh, maybe more informal, short-term. Uh, mentoring is more of a long-term supportive relationship, and this sometimes evolves over time as a person's career progresses, even in college, it may evolve over the four or five years that they're here on campus. Uh, but they're also very enmeshed. Next slide, please. So there's two different viewpoints. We got mentors and mentees. So that's like a one-on-one. -on -one. But more helpful is to have a network, a mentorship network, where it's multifaceted. Here we have a student who's interacting with their advisor, maybe a faculty advisor, maybe the Student Success Center. Uh, maybe doing an internship, maybe being a member of a professional organization. 
So we really need to develop these mentorship networks, not just think about it as a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So you're not putting the burden on one person uh, as a mentor to a student. You're making a safety net where everybody works together. And notice I've put arrows between COSM advisor and research advisor and uh, faculty advisor and student success center. So these, these different bubbles need to be communicating with each other with regard to the success of the student. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our committee was looking at what do we have on campus? What exists for our students with regard to this safety net? And so there are Wright State resources. We have retention coaches. Uh, this has to do with life interruptions. Uh, we know students sometimes have chaos in the home and there are some things that as faculty, we can't help them with. Um, Student Success Center has ac academic support in math and some 1000 and 2000 level courses. And then some uh, UVC courses that are open to students. We go down to the college level, we have academic advising, some career consultations, internships, some pre-professional advising, and some of the mentoring circles that have been created. But a lot of this happens at the department level, certainly having first year seminars, uh, student organizations uh, are very important where students get to know each other, could be professional, could be social, could be both. Also, faculty advising, having direct contact with a faculty member in your first year is very important. Um, the undergraduate research and the ASK program get students involved with faculty mentors and work internships are important. Next slide, please. So, do our students have adequate mentoring? We need to address some of these issues in the college and in departments. We have to work on fostering a sense of belonging. We need to work on advising our students properly. The COSM advisors and the department advisors need to communicate better what are students being told. Certainly study skills are important. And then professional advising, how do you help students learn about the profession and belong? Um, learning ethics of the profession often occurs in research labs. Uh, cultural awareness and social and racial identity training for faculty and students, even GTAs and LAs. Essentially here, we don't know what we don't know. And so we may not realize, we may be blind to the fact that we lack cultural awareness. Um, we lack an implementation of programs that already exist. And faculty need to be aware of the resources that exist across the institution. Next slide, please. So how do we make mentoring formal? Well, we can create these first and second year courses. We can reinforce these networks, the mentoring networks, make sure that they continue. A lot of student organizations are all hung on one faculty. And then when that faculty member retires, it, it's over. So there needs to be some way to institutionalize and make sure that programs are continuous uh, and so it's important that resources be provided for mentoring activities. Uh, short term solutions might be emphasizing some student organizations, um, having departments create mentoring specific to their programs, looking at opportunities for engaging students, um, assigning faculty members in departments for third and fourth year students who are definitely majors at that point. Um, creating and evaluating structures for departmental mentoring, recruiting and retaining faculty advisors for student organizations. That one's really important. Um, and then emphasizing opportunities for student engagement. A lot of times you provide food and they show up. Next slide, please. And then more long term. Educating students and faculty about what mentoring opportunities are there. Maybe we need a fact sheet for our faculty. What do you do if a student calls you up and says, uh, my boyfriend is chasing me, I'm being stalked, um, I'm, I'm frightened to come to class. You know, there's, these things happen to us and we need to know what to do when these things happen. 
Uh, we need to pair coaching and mentoring with departmental first year seminars. Um, we need to provide resources to institutionalize this. But we also very much need cultural awareness and social and racial identity training for faculty and students, anyone who's going to be in the classroom in a supervisory role. This needs to be something that continues uh, year after year. Uh, we need to evaluate department bylaws. Can we incentivize faculty to participate more in student engagement activities? And can we create cross departmental networking advisors? Maybe uh, physics and chemistry have a picnic together at the end of the term. Um, try to create things. Uh, one idea was having a traveling trophy where departments challenge each other and students are involved between departments. Um, how do we support, train, and reward our mentors in each department? That may be the last slide. Okay, questions or comments about that? Um, I have a question in terms of faculty incentives. Did you all um, try to figure out what kind of incentives um, are available? Um, to ask, it, at this point, I don't believe Wright State is in the position for monetary incentives. But as we're, you know, as faculty, what would get us to do something like this? What kind of incentive would be useful? And this could be not only to you, but maybe other people have other, because I think this is the key right here, and especially to get faculty in there. I think what, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Faculty are doing more and more and more. And as we replace tenure line faculty with non-tenure line faculty, the advising goes up, all kinds of things go up. And so faculty are pretty strung tight. Uh, so asking them to do more is a problem. Uh, faculty are evaluated based on criteria outlined in our collective bargaining agreement. And so one way to institutionalize that is to have people get credit for service related to uh, these types of activities with students. Now, ideally, we're all chill and we all have goodness in our heart for the students and we want to spend time with them and we want to help them grow as individuals, uh, but we all are also under a lot of pressure. So it's a balance and we need to have that discussion. And usually, oftentimes, service falls on one or two people in a department, and then when they retire, it's gone. And we've seen that in our department. So we have to reverse this trend somehow. That's a very good discussion to have. Very good question and a great um, way to, to begin wrapping this up as well. So it's, we're down to our last few minutes, so I do want to just take a couple minutes. Um, for those who have not been participating throughout the fall uh, or those that are from outside the college, we've used Teams, Microsoft Teams, to uh, coordinate and to manage these events. So a lot of the data that we've used, to, the data analysis reports are available. A lot of the literature that we've used are all available on the Teams site. So if you would like access to that, feel free to reach out to me and I will get that to you. And some of the resources that have been mentioned in the chat, I will get those out uh, as well. Um, but this is, this has been great. So I, I want to thank everybody for your participation. Where do we go from here? This is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, so uh, in the next in the coming weeks, we'll be summarizing a lot of the proposed solutions. There's a lot of overlap uh, across the four ideas, um, and we will be reviewing that with the department chairs and then uh, prioritizing some proposed solutions and forming working groups later in the semester. So that's where our plan is from here. Um, I will turn it back over to Kathy for any closing remarks. Yeah, thank you all for your participation. The chat has been fantastic, and I'm going to sit here and figure out a way to co copy it and then um, have it out as a document when we share all the other resources. Fr from the data, it's clear we have huge room for improvement. And this issue of low retention and then low graduation rates, if we could solve it, would by itself address our enrollment problem. So it is the problem of our day and of our university. Now, there's lots of complexities to why students leave, and no one thing that we change is going to be able to solve the problem all by itself. But I think all of us working together, and what I saw here in this whole process is the huge amount of progress we can make when we all do work together. So I have confidence that we're going to move that needle. I want to thank everybody that made today possible. 
your talents and your time were essential. I want to particularly thank Nick Christian, who more or less ran this whole thing and organized everyone. And Jason Dival was assisting him in that. And then our four chairs, Sylvia Newell, Rachel Aga, Audrey McGowan, and Jason Dival. So we will be having a little bit of a rest. We will update on this data and then we will begin phase two. So I welcome all of you that have been listening today to be feel free to join into that effort. Those of you who have done all this work already, in some sense, your job is done, but we welcome it if you want to continue working on this. Thank you. This was incredible. It's, it's made my day. It's made my semester. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.